with uh, Canto 26, the purgation of uh, the pilgrim is completed. He has been going through the various stages of uh, uh, purgatory from pride, as you remember, to the sin of lust. And uh, in 27, he crosses uh, a wall of fire um, so that he can be cleansed completely of all the stains that may be residual on his soul and approach and enter the, the, the Garden of Eden. This is the, uh, the action uh, uh, that takes place in 27. And Canto 27 comes to a close with uh, uh, a passage that I would like to read to you and comment on. It's at the end of Canto 27, and these are really the last words that Virgil will, will speak. We will not hear from him again. Um, in fact, from now on, the pilgrim will be entirely on his own. There is no dependency on him. There is a sort of uh, actually very personal moment now that it st starts, uh, and, and, and we'll see the drama that goes with this time of uh, this, this attainment of self-mastery that uh, Dante goes on dramatizing. These are the last words uh, that he speaks uh, from lines uh, 130 uh, on. Uh, 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 the temporal fire and eternal thou hast seen, meaning purgatory and, 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 and hell which lasts forever. My son, and I come to a part where of, my, of myself I discern no further. This is the limitation of Virgil's vision. This is from now on. He will be following even the, the geometry, the arrangement of uh, their journey will be completely reversed. Up to now, the pilgrim has been a disciple Therefore, one who follows the vestiges of the teacher. Now, uh, the teacher with uh, uh, Statius will be following uh, Virgil. He sees no further. And actually, I can anticipate for you the pathos of uh, Virgil's uh, uh, departure, suddenly departure, when he, the pilgrim, most wants him and needs him because Beatrice is approaching and the terror that uh, with the terror that Beatrice represents for the pilgrim, the pilgrim will turn back and his eyes will never see uh, Virgil again. Virgil has disappeared an instant before he vanishes, an instant before Beatrice arrives, as if there's a hiatus. Uh, Dante is dramatizing the hiatus between the two guides and the two uh, particular stages of his own self-knowledge and, and, and life. So let me continue with this. Thou that take henceforth thy pleasure for guide. What an extraordinary line. Take henceforth thy pleasure for guide. Uh, this is the poem of desire in the sense that what pushes the pilgrim to go on and uh, impels him to this journey of discovery and self-discovery is really desire. Desire is uh, the, 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 the moving force in him. Uh, but now the language changes. Now in a sense a certain, uh, the first part of the journey is over and pleasure can become uh, the guide, uh, the guidance of his own pleasure, what he likes. That is to say in a sense it's an adumbration of free will. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, the relationship between actually pleasure and happiness, the way Dante will go on dramatizing it and, and thinking about it in, uh, in, in paradise. Thou hast come forth from the steep and narrow ways. See the sun that shines on thy brow. See the grass that near the earthly paradise. See the grass, the flowers, and trees which the ground here brings forth of itself alone. It is as if by Dante, by taking his own pleasure uh, as his guidance, he now has reached an Edenic place. He's, he done, uh, Virgil is speaking of, of, of the pilgrim as if he was speaking of the ground that thrives 
uh, untilled the ground, the land produces spontaneously. Now he's capable of that spontaneous action and spontaneous uh, decisions. Till the fair eyes come, rejoicing, which weeping made come to made me come to thee. Uh, thou may sit or go among them. Uh, two details are expressed by these lines. One is uh, Virgil is recapitulating, in many ways, uh, this first part of the journey. The journey that began in Inferno 1 and then here in Purgatory in the Garden of Eden. It began in the wilderness and then in the garden. This is, this is the first step of uh, uh, the first part, stage of the journey. Uh, you can now, uh, he remembers, that's how he recapitulates, the fair eyes that made me, that begged me to come to your help when you were uh, lost in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in shipwrecked on the wilderness of Inferno 1. So now uh, Virgil is going back to that. The second element is that this is the exercise now. Thou mayst sit or go among them. Now this is exactly the major temptation for the pilgrim. Is he going to think that the journey to the Garden of Eden, which is a journey ahead, forward, but a journey back in time, the Garden of Eden is behind all of us, and yet it lies ahead of us. The past is really the future. He must decide whether he can go on or, 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 or sit here. It's a first decision. Is he going to think that the journey is the journey to the complacencies of the Garden, to the beauty and the attraction of the Garden, or is he going to turn, as he actually will, we, have a, we can say that because we have paradise, that he writes, into an anti pastoral poet. That is to say, one, a poet who is always questioning the sense of arrival and is always going on to new departures. That's really what the, the Virgil is telling him. Now, this is up to you. You have arrived here. You have arrived there where I am, where Virgil is, or you can even go further. This has a, a, there's a peculiar language that resonates behind this kind of moral dilemma which is placed in front of uh, the pilgrim's mind. It's called Felix Culpa. I don't know if you have, have you know, those of you who are readers of Milton may know what I'm talking about. Felix Culpa. The idea that the fall of man was actually a happy fall because it allows human beings to even want to go beyond it. So that's, that's exactly what is resonating behind this. You may sit and therefore be, uh, turn into an Adam figure who is going back to the, the beauty and innocence, which the pilgrim doesn't have really. He has a wisdom now uh, of the garden, or you can go on even uh, further than that. And then uh, here is the final uh, moment of, of, of uh, this, a circle which is uh, now takes over for the, 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 the purgatorio uh, itself, no longer expect word or sign from me. That's, that's exactly the, the, the teaching of, the, of, of Virgil has been completed. And then he ends with free, upright, and whole is thy will. And it were a fault not to act on its bidding. Therefore, over thyself a crown and mitre thee. This is the attainment of the free will, so that the whole of the purgatorio moves between two poles. The pole of liberty, which was Cato's uh, object, the object of his quest through the wilderness of the Libyan desert, and now the attainment of, the, of, the, of free will, which allows the pilgrim to view it as a condition, not just a point of arrival, but the necessary precondition for moral life. You can never really have a free and autonomous moral life only in the measure in which you think you can have the free will. Now the pilgrim is his own responsibility. And let me say that once he's under the guidance of Beatrice, the issues, especially when it comes to paradise, there will be moral problems while he is in the Garden of Eden, we are going to look at in a moment. But in paradise, aesthetics takes over. It's no longer an, an ethical problem. Dante reverse you may have heard about you know, recent philosophers who think that life is arranged or knowledge is arranged according to stages, the aesthetic, the ethical, and then the theological. Dante reverses this. Dante, the point that seems to be the most mature is that of dealing with the aesthetic one, which others may view as the superficial, the elementary one. 
the one where we our perceptions are going to be engaged and then uh, the, 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 the time of disengagement even before you can get involved and mature in uh, ethical experiences. Dante changes uh, all of this. There are no ethical dilemmas in paradise. Once you are in paradise, you can only enjoy or, and get to know the world. The, all the problems are intellectual problems, not moral, uh, moral issues. So free, upright, and holy is thy will, and it were a fault not to act on its bidding. Therefore, over thyself I crown a mitre thee. This is a kind of secular coronation ceremony, the crown. Uh, the royal and the episcopal, uh, the royal and the bishop, uh, which is a, a way of, of, uh, of, of consecrating uh, Virgil acts as a kind of lay priest, consecrating the attainment of uh, self-mastery, this moment which could become a moment of self-assertion, and yet uh, Dante is very careful uh, uh, in how he navigates uh, all of this. Now, from Canto 28, to Canto 33, which is the end of the poem, we uh, come to an area which is another fragment. You already read a kind of segment, which I would call the literary segment, uh, that uh, uh, with Professor Lumos, whom I'm very grateful to, uh, covered and explained to you and did with you last, last time. That's a literary segment that goes from 21 to 26. Now from 28 to 33, we have a different segment, which is, let's call it a, a pastoral, Oasis. It's also the representation of what in uh, uh, classical literature is called a locus amenus. Uh, you may have seen adumbrations of this in, even in limbo. That's one of them, this, this lovely spot outside of the world of history where something of uh, uh, relaxation can take place. And it's also, uh, which Dante combines uh, actually with the biblical Ortus enclosed garden, uh, the, the, of the Song of Songs, for instance, or the Garden of Eden, the Ortus Conclusus. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Dante's representation of the Locus Amenus is that it's never really outside of history. It becomes, that's the assumption, you know, you have the garden and you have the city. This is the, the dual imagination, you know, whenever life becomes unbearable in the city, you take off and go into your villa in the garden somewhere and, and find the relief, aesthetic relief uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the hustle, uh, the time of hustle and bustle of, of, of the city. Dante combines the two. There's no easy opposition between them in the sense that the Garden of Eden where he finds himself is going to be the place of uh, a very problematical place, a place where the pilgrim is engaged in uh, a self-confrontation. He uh, experiences some uh, actually uh, terrifying, uh, uh, terrifying moments in, uh, in the encounter with, uh, with Beatrice. So the Garden of Eden is represented in Canto 28, and I want to read a few passages. This is, uh, uh, you see how this representation uh, is carried out. Eager now to search, from reading from 28, Line, lines from one and following, and I'll, I'll go pretty, pretty slowly over this. Eager now to search within and about the divine forest, uh, green and dense, which tempered to my eyes the new day, I left the slope without waiting longer, taking the level very slowly over the ground, which gave fragrance on every side. It's the classical, this, the, this is the, uh, all the, 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 the warehouse of the pastoral tradition is found here. Fragrance is a, uh, a running brook, uh, deep shades, uh, the birds seem to be rivaling human beings in producing songs, N a plenitude of the natural order, and, and uh, even the innocence of the natural order, with the exception that Dante comes, and though he has been cleansed and gone through the wall of fire, to further purify him, he is not uh, the kind of new Adam. He carries with him the stains of experience and the stains of uh, uh, history. So there is desire uh, that acts in him. But let me continue. Sweet air that I was without change was striking on my brow with the force only of a gentle breeze, but which the fluttering boughs 
all bent freely on the part where the holy mountain throws its first shadow, yet were not so much swayed from the erectness that the little birds in the tops did not still practice all their arts. But singing, they greeted the morning hours with a full gladness among the leaves, which kept such undertones to their rhymes as gathers from branch to branch in the pine wood of the Chiasi shore, where Eros loses its Sirocco. The interesting thing, which is some kind of uh, uh, the poignancy of uh, autobiography and, and uh, uh, is that Dante is imagining the Garden of Eden as the, uh, the pine wood near Ravenna, which has completely disappeared since then, uh, actually. Uh, but uh, it, it's, you can imagine how he would take the morning walks in the pine trees around the city and on the way to the, uh, the sea. Uh, and that for him was uh, uh, the garden, this mixture of the ordinary and uh, the great sublime imagination. That's, that's the, what I'm, I, I think is he wants to convey to us. And now he continues. And I will ask you a question. I want you to think about what I'm going to ask you because you're expected to have a shock of recognition in the next three lines. And these are the lines in English. I'll read them in Italian. One, another little homage to my friend, Professor Brooks. Uh, Già m'avean trasportato i lenti passi dentro alla selva antica tanto che io non potea riveder onde io m'intrassi. Ed ecco, più andar mi tolse un rio che in verso sinistra con sue piccole onde piegava l'erba che in suo ripo uscio. And the English is already my slow steps had brought me so far within the ancient wood that I could not see the place where I had entered, and lo, my going farther was prevented by stream with which, which with its little waves bent left towards the grass that sprang on its bank. And this is my question. What is this? What do these lines remind you of? They are meant to remind you of that. The very beginning of Inferno. Very good. Very good which means that this is now really a new departure for him, which means that the Garden of Eden is exactly the wilderness that we saw and we left behind, seen from a different perspective, which means that the supernatural world is the natural world with a different, through a different lens and a different perspective, okay? This is, uh, he's now, reenacting exactly the, the, the drama of Inferno 1. There's no shipwreck. The mountain has been climbed. Remember that he tried to climb the mountain? The mountain has been climbed. A new departure is going to take place. So here we go then with uh, this, this idea of the, that's what I mean, the anti-pastoral Dante, the poet who dismisses and, 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 and refuses and, and repudiates all the temptations of gardens all the temptations of premature halting, premature self-enclosure into the, the fiction of gardens. Uh, this is really the strongest element that I would have to point out about what's happening in Canto 28. Now, what does he see? All the waters are purest here, would seem to have some defilement in them beside that which conceals nothing through its, uh, th though it flows quite dark under the perpetual shade which never lets sun or moon shine there. With feet I stopped and with eyes passed over beyond the streamlet to look at the great variety of fresh flowering boughs and there appeared to me, and the word now is really with the power and force of an apparition, another epiphany of beauty and love to him, to me as appears of a, s of a sudden thing that for one that drives away every other thought, a lady all alone who went singing and calling flowers from flower with which the wall was painted. This is Matelda, as you have read, a woman who goes with dancing, uh, singing, and gathering flowers. A true picture of fascination, of aesthetic fascination for, for him. Um, to give you the sense of how, oh, some resonance, and in case you're still looking for a, a, a term, uh, the, the final paper topic, uh, you might want to read, there is a, a, uh, a poem, uh, there is a tradition of poetry, which is really Provencal, called 
pastorel. The pastorel. The pastorel was in the a big practitioner is Dante here. That's what he's writing. It's the idea of the knight who goes to the woods or the meadow and meets a young shepherdess, gets off, it's very sensual, gets off uh, the wood and woos uh, off the horse and woos this uh, young, young woman and usually ends with a kind of uh, pun on the ex and promises of the excesses of paradise. So it's really an erotic kind of uh, song. But the other practitioner of this, of this genre was Dante's own friend, Guido Cavalcanti. Dante is using the modes and really definitely taking his distance from him. There is a, there is, this is a love scene. There's nothing of the overtones of violence and erotic violence that Guido Cavalcanti had celebrated in his own version of the pastorel. Uh, so uh, a genre which is common to them. Now this instead where he says, pray, fair lady, who warmest thyself in love's beams. Now Dante has just come out of the circle of lust. He has been cleansing himself, and yet this is the, the, the uh, lingering trace of his history, the lingering trace of his body and his humanity. Here he goes through the Garden of Eden as a fallen man who is redeemed and not quite uh, redeemed, certainly not in the rest restored or reinstated into the innocence of the pre Lapsarian uh, garden. If I'm to believe the looks which I want to be testimony of the heart, as it were, may it please thee to come forward to the stream so near that I may hear what you singest. You make me recall where and what was Proserpina at the time her mother, Lacerius, lost her and she the spring. That's the first. Now it's a series of three mythological images. This is the first. I think of you as Proserpina. But it's also a story of Proserpina, as you know. Well, it's, it's stated in the text, uh, the, the, the story of the young woman who is walking, uh, picking flowers on the plains of Enna in Sicily, and then death comes and takes her away. It's a kind of uh, uh, death itself, loving human beings and taking them. Uh, that's one myth. The second one is a lady turns in the dance with feet close together and so on. And I skip a few lines. And I do not believe such light shone from beneath the lids of Venus when through strange mischance she was pierced by her son. The second image I think is more telling. It's the story of Venus wounded by the arrows of Cupid and falling in love with Cupid. And I think it's more telling because it's Dante's way of casting, without going into psychoanalysis or psychoanalytical explanations, but Dante's casting the Garden of Eden as also a desire to return to the state of infancy of the child with the mother, only to understand that this is really a fantasy that would lead him nowhere. And in fact, the third image is that of uh, uh, an erotic image again, but one of uh, distance. Three paces that ever kept us apart, but Hellespont where Zeus is passed, a bridal still on men's boast, did not bear more hatred from Leander than swelling waters between Sestos and Abydos than, th than that from me, because it didn't open then. So that this, this barrier between uh, Matelda and the pilgrim. Between Dante and the fantasy of what the Garden of Eden may be, the mother, here is kept and, and Dante has to continue. So he goes on explain, she goes on explaining what uh, uh, this, g how the, the mechanics, so to say, about uh, uh, the, the, the Garden of Eden and then the canto ends in, uh, and I look at this end from lines 140 and with this, those, line 140 and, and, and following, those who in old times sang of the age of gold and of its happy state, perhaps dreamed on Parnassus of this place. Here, the human root was innocent. Here was lasting spring. And every fruit, this is the nectar of which each tells. I turned and right around to my poets and saw that they had heard the last sentence with a smile. Then I brought my eyes back to the fair lady. Uh, from Dante's point of view, the perplexity that he feels 
is the perplexity of Virgil and the perplexity of Statius. They know no more than he does. He knows no more than they do. Uh, what is the other, the burden of this passage is that the, uh, uh, clearly Dante is alluding to the bucolic quality of this place. But it also suggests that in, in passing that the ancient, actually he says that the ancient poets prefigured the Garden of Eden uh, in the fabulous visions of the Golden Age and the Parnassus. He's establishing a link between the poetic visions and the, this encounter that he has in the Garden of Eden, both projections of the poetic uh, uh, imagination. Uh, uh, so it also means that the Garden of Eden can be like the bucolic fantasy of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the poets and Parnassus. We skip 29, which is a uh, uh, story of uh, really the uh, world history here from uh, as an allegory, the pageant of uh, uh, Revelation. And uh, I will move to Canto 30, which will take us a little bit of time. This is the canto, predictably, where since Beatrice is the one who is linked with the number three, this is the canto where Beatrice will arrive. Unsurprisingly, for those of you who are lovers of this uh, uh, open or hidden symmetries in the poem, Canto 30 of Paradise is also the canto where Beatrice will disappear. Her residence in the poem lasts for exactly 33 cantos. Clearly, it's not an accident. Her name is three times the good. She's in the, the Vita Nuova, is linked with three. It's this kind of way of uh, uh, the arcane significance of her presence in the pilgrims, uh, in the lover's uh, uh, life. So um, a canto that uh, describes a double drama, the drama of Virgil's disappearance and the arrival of Beatrice, a change of the god, as it were, in many ways. But you have two different moods, one of elegy for the uh, loss of, uh, of, 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 Vir of Virgil and the other one of uh, uh, sacred terror at the arrival of, uh, of, of, uh, of Beatrice. So it, uh, it begins, um, he hears singing line 70, Veni sponsa de Libano, uh, which of course is uh, an echo from the Song of Songs. So the erotics of the previous canto continues now here, in the, since the Song of Songs is notoriously uh, one of the sublime love poem, uh, it continues here in uh, Canto 30 in anticipation of, be of the arrival of Beatrice. As the blessed shall rise at the last trump, each eager from his tomb, the reclad voice singing hallelujah, they arose on the divine chariot at the voice of so great an elder, a hundred ministers and ma messengers of eternal life who claimed, who cried, Benedictus qui venes. This is um, now an allusion, as maybe your notes will tell you, or should tell you, to the greetings of Jesus in the garden when he comes, I'm sorry, to Jerusalem. And it says, Benedictus qui venit, the, the, which means that Beatrice means a number of things. First of all, a, a, a typological connection between garden and city, which we have already been seeing here. The garden is not opposed to the political, let's say, to the city, it is the history and the garden come together in Dante's imagination. But there is a further typology that the Beatrice comes the way Jesus came into history, Beatrice will come into the soul of the lover. So that she is surrounded, she has wrapped in a kind of aura of a Christological language and she will become, let's say, grace, the way one can experience grace. In, in, in the world through this kind of uh, direct love onto uh, oneself. So Latin again, and then a third image and throwing flowers up and down, manibus odate lilia plena. Another uh, three, state, three phrases in Latin. He will go on translating a fourth one. This is a, a, a more interesting uh, image because it's taken straight out of the Aeneid of book six of uh, Virgil's Aeneid. So it's already a homage to a Virgil who is about to disappear. You see how the dramas here are sort of interwoven. 
uh, the idea of uh, what, what the garden is and how is the garden related to oneself, uh, to one's history. The idea of uh, the arrival and the meaning of Beatrice into the life of the pilgrim. And then also the loss of Virgil as a poet and uh, whatever his vision may be. And this, whatever his vision may be is indicated by this fragment. The fragment refers to the premature death that Virgil celebrates in a very elegiac way in Book Six of the Aeneid, where Aeneas uh, has gone down into Hades in order to see the whole of history. This is the descent into the oracles, the father, and to see Anchises, but this is the whole, the future that is going to derive and stem from him, uh, and, 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 and Anchises will point out to him the shade of a young man who sits on the side, sad, his name is Marcellus, who will die too young, and then they will add, or oh, uh, throw lilies with open hands, the lily being a funereal symbol, uh, right? The, the, the chrysanthemums, for instance, or some such things in, uh, in some cultures. So it's an image of a premature death, which clearly is linked also to Beatrice, but who died in a premature, uh, premature death, but also to Virgil, because it's the anticipation of the loss of Virgil. It's an elegiac way. It is as if Virgil's vision was under the aegis of mortality and infinitude. As if, as if Virgil could never really be thought of as saved because his song is a song limited to the world of death. Uh, and let's see um, how this continues. I once saw at the beginning of the day the eastern part all rosy and the rest of the sky clear and beautiful as the sun's face comes forth shaded, etc. Uh, a lady appeared to me. This is Beatrice. Girt with olive over a white veil. Look at her, her elegance. Listen to how he describes the colors, the fashions. Girt with olive uh, over a white veil, clothed under a green mantle with the color of a living flame. And my spirit, I call that the Italian flag, by the way, the way she seems to be, the red, white, and green. And my spirit, which now so long had not been overcome with all, trembling her presence, without having more knowledge by the eyes, the hidden virtue that came from her, felt all love's great power. This is a rewriting of the poem of the autobiography of Dante that you remember reading, the Vita Nuova. Uh, he's experiencing in the presence of Beatrice exactly the kind of effects that she has over him. Uh, the, the courtly love, the sweet new style, the trembling, the inability to speak. As soon as her lofty virtue smote on my sight, which already had pierced me before I was out of my boyhood, I turned to the left with the confidence of a little child that runs to his mother when he's afraid or in distress to say to Virgil, not a drop of blood is left in me that does not tremble. I know the marks of the ancient flame. He's uh, scared and turns to Virgil and is about to say, and he will say the famous lines, I know the marks of the ancient flame, which is a translation of the words Dido will speak when she meets Aeneas in Hades. I know the marks of the ancient flame. Another image of death and mortality taken from the Aeneid. Dante is linking Virgil with that kind of metaphor uh, and that sort of limitation of passion. But Virgil had left us bereft of him, Virgil's sweetest father, Virgil to whom I gave myself for my salvation. Nor did all the ancient mother lost avail my cheeks, washed with dew that they should not be stained again with tears. And this is Beatrice's first words, Dante, because Virgil leaves thee, weep not, weep not yet, for thou must weep for another sword, like an admirable who goes to poop and proud to see the men that serve on the other ships and to hearten them in their work. So on the left side of the car, when I turned at the sound of my name, which is noted here of necessity, I saw the lady who first appeared to me veiled under the angelic festival direct her eyes on me beyond the stream. Already the veil that fell from her head and circled with Minerva's leaves did not let her be plainly seen royally, still stern in her be bearing. She continued like one who, while she speaks, holds back her, his hottest words. Look at me well, 
I am, I am indeed Beatrice. How dost thou approach the mountain? Didst thou not know that here man is happy? Um, well, a number of things here. Uh, Virgil has disappeared. Dante now is alone, so it's, that's what I call the self-confrontation with his past. Who is Beatrice? How am I going to account for my failings to Beatrice? And what is this she going to expect of me? She's harsh, uh, the, lang the harsh language of love, to the point, if I may be a little bit, to, to without really lessening the intensity of this passage. This passage is pretty intense, but I feel that I have to tell you uh, a little, uh, to distract you a little bit for 10 seconds. Um, Borges has written about this passage, one of a beautiful, beautiful essay um, on, on this scene. And he says, this is the only time that Dante really made a mistake. Because when if Beatrice spoke to me, the way he spo she spoke to Virgil, to Dante, I'm sorry, I would have said to her, Look, that's the way you feel. I'm going to go right back. <laughs> and, uh, but Dante won't say that. This is, uh, this is a contemporary uh, visionary like, uh, like Borges, not Dante. Well, we are told is that this is the first and only time in the poem that Dante's name is heard. Dante. She will never call him Dante again, and he has never been called Dante before. In other words, this is the point where the poem, from the epic that it has been, the epic of desire, the epic of hope, the pilgrim lost between longing and memory, uh, between hope and memory. Um, uh, the poem of justice, now it becomes an autobiography. Now it is its own story. There is a shift in genre from an epic story, from the loss of Virgil, the epic poet, to an autobiographical focus. Dante, this is you, the specificity and irreducibility of his own experience. Dante, he says, and he will add, weep not, weep not, and, so, and, and he, will, he, he will add that his name has, is here registered out of necessity. And what is the necessity that he has? What's, what's the necessity about speaking of oneself? Why would one be, go on speaking of oneself? One speaks of oneself, um, uh, either because one wants to be exemplary to others, one believes that what, what one has experienced is crucial for somebody else's uh, uh, self-knowledge, somebody else's experience, or one wants to exempt vituperation from his own name. It's da I'm, I'm paraphrasing Dante's words and the, the, way, the way he registers them in this uh, uh, philosophical text that he writes called The Banquet, where he speaks about himself and he says, there are two people who have spoken about themselves in exemplary ways. One is Augustine in the Confessions, a book that I have asked you repeatedly to read and I have read from. And the other one is Boethius that I have alluded to in the Consolation of Philosophy. The philosopher who is in jail and seeks to find comfort to the, uh, the, the, the imputations of criminal conduct uh, laid on him by thinking about philosophy and talking about himself. And whereas Augustine, of course, is discussing his own, uh, his own conversion. So the idea of the necessity is uh, both, uh, Dante is alluding to two autobiographical texts, uh, both of which make it uh, uh, the, the talking about oneself, indeed as he calls it, uh, a necessity. Uh, so this now will uh, continue and uh, with Canto 30, uh, the first thing that she will do, Beatrice will do, and we turn to Canto 31. There's an account of uh, Canto 30 continues with uh, uh, the story of uh, his uh, um, failures when she died, as told in the Vita Nuova. He went on looking for someone who could replace uh, Beatrice and now Dante goes on uh, asking, uh, actually uh, indulging in a confession, literally an Augustinian moment, another part of the autobiographical moment, a, a confession of form. Uh, and this is, uh, let me just uh, read a few, a few uh, lines here before we move on. Uh, o thou that art on that side of the sacred river, she began again turning against me the point of her speech, which even with the edge that seemed sharp to me and continued without pause, Say, say if this is true, to such an accusation 
the confession must needs be joined. My faculties were so confounded that my voice began and was spent before it was released from its organs. She forbore a little, then said, What thinkest thou? Uh, a phrase that should remind you. I know that it's too little and I would not be uh, too demanding, but it should remind you uh, about the fact this is Francesca's. This is what, what Dante was asking Francesca in Canto V. And now it's Beatrice, the roles are inverted, who is asking Dante to resume, as it were, that confession of a failing that Francesca had undergone in Canto V of, of Inferno. What, think, what thinkest thou? Answer me, for thy sad memories are not yet destroyed in thee by the water. Confusion and fear mingled together drove forth from my mouth a yes, such that to hear it there was, ne was need of sight as a crossbow shot with two great strains breaks the cord. Uh, let me just go on after uh, with lines 36. After heaving a bitter sigh, I had already, I had hardly the voice to answer and the lips shaped it with difficulty weeping. I said present things with a false pleasure, turn my steps as soon as your face was hid. Uh, the, the, uh, he's alluding exactly as he did in the Vita Nuova to his change of heart as soon as Beatrice uh, died. And now we con she continues, and she had thou kept silence or denied what thou confessest, thy fault would be no less plain by such a judge is it known. But when from a man's own cheek uh, breaks forth condemnation of his sin, in our court the will turns back against the edge. Nevertheless, in order that thou mayst now bear the shame of thy wanderings. And another time, hearing the sirens be stronger, lay aside the sowing of tears and hearken. So shalt thou hear how my buried flesh should have directed thee the other way. Never did nature or art set before the beauty so great as the fair members, etc. Um, the passage is extraordinary because it helps us to gloss retrospectively uh, what was a fairly mysterious allegory in uh, Purgatory. You remember where Dante meets the sirens or dreams of the sirens. Um, and then a lady appeared. The siren is, uh, was an allegory of a temptation, an erotic temptation, someone who wants to lure the pilgrim and promises happiness. You remember? I'm, I'm going to make you happy. You, are you need to go nowhere else. Uh, and now, uh, uh, and then we, there, was, there was also the appearance of uh, uh, a mysterious woman, an equally mysterious woman, who manages to um, uh, send away uh, the, the, the siren. She, she wakes up the pilgrim, and the journey there can, can continue. And uh, if, if you recall, we were saying, well, we don't know who this mysterious woman is, though there are a number of hints. I had read this part of the poem before you have probably, and, and, uh, uh, and it's Beatrice. Beatrice, so there was a kind of an allegory of the confrontation of two women, the siren on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, this unknown, mysterious Beatrice. Now this scene just uh, makes it clear, because what Beatrice says, you have to make a confession in case shame, now bear the shame of thy wanderings, and another time hearing the siren, be stronger. Lay aside the sowing of tears and hearken. Thou shalt hear how my buried flesh and so on. So she is now glossing the scene of, uh, of the siren that appeared in Canto 19. But there is more to it. Because there is a little phrase that Dante is using, uh, another, or Beatrice is using for him, another time when you hear the siren which means that the siren is not just the encounter with the siren, it's not just an event that happened in the past, it can happen all over again. Another time, in other words, it can still happen in the future, which means that Dante's conversion, which is really what this poem has been telling us, especially now, which uh, the, ha has reached this kind of autobiographical quality, is not over and done with that it is a conversion has to be understood as an ongoing journey, and that the future itself is fraught with temptations, just as much as it was fraught with, fraught with temptations in the past. 
What Dante is changing is the Augustinian idea of a conversion or that takes place once and for all. And is making, is replacing that paradigm with a different paradigm, a paradigm of a conversion in its openness to time, with the idea that it is an ongoing process. So you have, uh, look at what the, 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 the poetic technique is. Dante is remembering a scene of the past and glossing that, the encounter and the temptation with Irene moved away, dispelled by uh, the arrival of Beatrice. Now Beatrice is talking once again about this Irene, another time, meaning I know who she was in Canto 19, of, in the dream of Canto 19, she may come back again. Uh, in other words, once again, this is the anti-pastoral imagination of the poet. Do not believe that you can ever stop on the way. Do not ever believe that there are truths that are going to be unchallenged or untested in time. And I think that this is a way of uh, truly uh, casting Dante for what he is, the poet of, uh, uh, the poet of uh, uh, open to the power of the future and, and drawn to the idea that the future is still uh, part of his, uh, his experience. And then by the way, he goes on, which I would really take us, uh, but that's th the essential point. Uh, truly that thou is, this is uh, line 55, uh, thou owest at the first shaft of deceptive things to have risen up after me who was such no longer. No young girl or other vanity of such brief worth should have bent thy wings downward to await more shots. A young chick waits for two or three, but in vain is the net, net spread or arrow and so on. Uh, this is uh, another, literally, the allusion to the poems that Dante wrote for what he called the pargoletta, the, little, the, the young woman uh, that Beatrice seems to be remind him uh, 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 of. Um, and now we come to uh, Canto 33, the end of Purgatory, uh, the end of Purgatory where I really want to um, uh, focus on one image, uh, one image in particular, which is, uh, which, which is uh, the image of a prophecy uh, that uh, Beatrice uh, uh, will make. Beatrice, we are at the end of time, Purgatory, and uh, he goes on, she goes on, I'm sorry, promising a deliverer who will come. Uh, the argument now is no longer about Dante himself, it's an argument about history. Is there a deliverance for history? Uh, is it possible for the whole human family to go back to a condition that at least, if not the Garden of Eden is such, from the point of view of which we can see at least the towers of the true city. That's the way Dante calls it in the political tract, Monarchia. So he's talking about uh, a figure that may enter history, that will enter history at the end of time. That's why I stress that dramatically the poem is, is li uh, literally poised at the, at the outer edge of time. There's no time when we go into paradise once again. So let me tell you what this, and, and, and we'll try to explain it for you, uh, lines uh, 30 and following. And she said to me, from fear and shame, I will have thee free thyself henceforth, that thou mayest no longer speak like one that dreams. Know that the vessel, she's tough, she's tough. The way she's, uh, she's attacking him, uh, uh, she will be the teacher from now on. Know that the vessel the serpent broke was and is not, but let him that has the blame be assured that God's vengeance fears no sob. Not for all the time shall the eagle, probably the eagle of the empire, be without air that left its feathers on the car so it became, became monster and then pray. For I see assuredly and therefore tell of it Stars already near to give us the time secure from all check and hindrance when a 500, 10 and 5, one sent from God shall slay the thievish woman and the giant who sins with her. And perhaps my dark tale like the Themis and the Sphinx persuades thee less because in their fashion it clouds thy mind, but soon the facts shall be the naiads that will solve this hard enigma without loss of flocks and horns. So 
she delivers an enigma, an enigmatic prophecy. Enigma is a word that obviously means mystery, but it's also linked to allegory. You know, we talk about irony, allegory. They're all tropes that uh, grammarians place under the same uh, general subdivision. It's, a, it's, it's an enigma. Uh, it's mysterious. It's not quite clear. And the lack of clarity only adds, I think, to, to the, the fear uh, uh, and the speculations, of course, about what this is. It's a numerical symbol, which is presented. He says it's a 500, 10, and 5. Uh, that's the way it's written, a 500, 10, and 5, 515. Um, and you do know that numbers, we have been talking a little bit about this, numbers are uh, viewed as containing medieval numerical symbolism, views numbers as containing the essence and the secrets actually of creation. They would go on writing. Isidore of Seville goes on writing sentences, take the number away from things and things will perish, will fall apart. What It's a Pythagorean idea. What keeps all things together is just this sense of, uh, call it musical, rhythmic, uh, uh, numerical ordering. Uh, and of course, the great other number that maybe everybody knows is a 666, which is the number of, of the Antichrist, right? So Nantes is writing a 500, 1, and 5. What on earth could it be? All of the speculations, I could, uh, I could, I could, uh, it, they're hilarious, some of the spec wh what they could mean. There are those who believe, well, it really refers to the year 13. 15. We have no reason to believe it. This is because it's 800, the year of uh, Charlemagne declaring the Holy Roman Empire, and 515 gives you 1315. So Dante is really thinking about an imminent event in his own time. There's nothing in the text that will allow us to see this and allow us to make it credible. So what is it? Uh, actually, it was found uh, that the way, the best way to describe it is really in written in DXV in uh, 510 and 5. Um, that this is the, the best way to try to make any sense of this uh, prophecy. And of course, another hilarious interpretation that I just regaled to you for your own relax temporary relaxation. This was immediately became the uh, 5X uh, Dux. Uh, he, uh, between 1923 and 1943, this was a prophecy of Mussolini, of all people who would come and deliver the, 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 the world. Another ridiculous, of course, interpretation. But it was found by some very good, by two, simultaneously, it's amazing, the two historians, one actually a historian, one a literary historian, and therefore they took two different views, that in the medieval illustrations, there is a moment, by the way, let me just preamble this. this is, they found it in medieval illustrations of the mass. There's a moment in the mass when there's a so-called uh, uh, antiphonal prayers, you know, the, the, the idea that Christ is coming sacramentally, and they have, uh, they have uh, the truly, it is truly right and, uh, and just, and in Latin, veredinium et justum est, it's V, the D, and it's always written like this, and they explain V and X, the cross that joins the human and the divine, so that really the prayer, or the enigma of Beatrice, is for the apocalyptic end of time, the time when uh, uh, Christ will return to earth the first time he came, first of all, as a human being, five, 10, and 500. The second time he will come first in his divinity, so 500, 10, and, 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 and five. The divinity and the humanity second, the second element. The two humanity and divinity joined together by the X of the cross. Great discovery number of infinite problems that I have, I hope I have, uh, let me bear with me for a couple of minutes so that I can tell you more uh, about it. If this is an apocalyptic symbol, this is to say you understand what we mean by an apocalyptic symbol, right? Apocalyptic prophecy. The prophecy, apocalypse, means for visionary, coming from the apocalypse of St. John and implying that Dante believes in some kind of imminent end of time, right? History is coming to an end. If he believed in this, that this is to be understood as an apocalyptic symbol of an imminent end of time, this would make Dante what is called a Joachist, 
and I have to explain to you who this man is. It's, there's a, a man by the name of Joachim of Flora who was a, a, a would see him in paradise. Joachim of Flora who had a theory of history in a kind of tripartite structure, Joachim of Flora. Uh, the, uh, the idea is that history uh, is patterned on the Trinity, so there is an age of the Father, which roughly goes from creation to the time of the biblical patriarch. Then there is the age of the Son that goes from the time of the incarnation to roughly 1260, his own time. This is Joachim of Flora. And then there's in the age of the spirit that goes from the, the, uh, the time of 1260 where when thanks to the fraternal orders, all structures and all institutions will disappear and, hum and, and, and mankind will experience a time of brotherhood and chastity. There'll be no marriages, there'll be no state, there will be nothing. Uh, and I say California is already anticipated and seen by this uh, great figure of Joachim of Flora. If, the, if, if Dante were a, jo a Joachist, that would create a number of problems because what I have just been describing to you was viewed as a most heretical theory of history. Why was it heretical? Because in effect, Joachim of Flora was, uh, with his theory, an age of the father, the age of the Son and the age of the Spirit was in effect undoing the unity of the Trinity. Uh, that is to say, the Trinity is no longer simultaneously together. He's dividing the Trinity into three distinct parts. And no less a great theologian of the Dante's own time, whom Dante will encounter very soon in Paradise, and they're going to discuss Joachim of Flora together, Bonaventure, will go on really uh, writing a piece in order to declare Joachim of Flora uh, heretical. So this is a, a very powerful explanation that Dante is really alluding to the second coming at the end of time, the DXV, uh, when Christ will return to earth to restore the messianic advent, to restore justice to the world, uh, and will come first of all in glory of the divinity first and the humanity second, both joined by the cross, the humanity and the divinity together. Uh, then, and it is not an uh, is he an apocalyptic writer? I doubt that he's an apocalyptic writer because there's no poet I know, and I think we have given plenty of evidence of this over the last two months, who cares more about the institutions, who believes that the institutions are history. And of course, he attacks them in the measuring in which he thinks that they have to be uh, revitalized, refreshed, and improved. But you cannot go on attacking the institutions uh, from uh, without really believing in their vital importance in history. He talks about the empire, he talks about the church, he talks about um, uh, law, he talks about uh, uh, family, etc. They're all institutions that preserve their enduring importance. So if he's not an apocalyptic writer, where is he then? I think that this is an allusion to uh, the coming of uh, the, the, the second coming but without removing all the jokistic uh, peripheralia that accompany that prophecy. This is indeed the time. It doesn't refer to the now of history. It refers to a time that nobody can really fathom and nobody can really know. So I'm giving, I have given you a reading of this passage and, and, and given you a glimpse of the, the logical complications that are usually accompany what would seem to be such a neat uh, uh, discovery or a neat uh, glossing of an image. And of course, with uh, this prophecy, the poem will come to an end, and the poem comes to an end with uh, Dante, who goes, and I will talk about this image again, who has to be uh, ritually immersed. He will be immersed into two rivers, the river Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, and the river Unoe, the river of good memories. It's a ritual op uh, operation. This is toward the end of Canto 33 that reminds you of the ritual actions at the beginning of Canto 1, where Dante washes his face and has to gird his loins with, you remember, with the reed that was growing spontaneously on uh, the shore of, uh, of the sea. But what Dante goes on saying is that the two rivers, Lethe and Junoe, derive, flow out of the same source. 
And then he says, like two lazy friends, friends who are fond of each other, they go on departing lazily. That's the image that he uses. What is interesting is that he's thinking of memory and forgetfulness, the Lethe and you know it, as impaling each other. So that there's no erasure, which is not at the same time a memory, that each contains the other. And Dante will go, has a lot to say about forgetful memory, especially in the, the way the poem will be written. And finally, uh, uh, with a, a line, the, the, the whole poem ends with a, the whole purgatorio ends with a line that obviously uh, reminds you of uh, um, the, the, uh, the very b end of the inferno. From that most holy water, this is Canto 33, I came forth again remade even as new plants, the very language of the beginning of Purgatorio 1, uh, renewed with new leaves, pure and ready to mount to the stars. Dante once again now is uh, uh, at the top of Purgatorio and he will fly next like lightning onto the moon and we shall see him in this kind of planetary epic, cosmological epic that uh, will start on uh, next time. But now I'm sure you have uh, uh, questions and well, we are doing okay with timing. So, so please uh, shoot. Yes. Very good so question. Kind of yes, uh, the the question is uh, that I spoke about uh, in Canto 30 of Purgatorio. I spoke about the transition, formal transition, from uh, uh, the 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 structure of the epic with uh, Virgil, the poet of the epic, and then uh, moving on to. In effect, I spoke of uh, the autobiographical. Uh, first of all, that where, where Beatrice uh, refers to, calls Dante by name. So it's his story, Dante. Don't cry because Virgil has disappeared. I'm going to give you a chance to cry for other reasons. And then goes on into a confession, which is an Augustinian poem. But also it's true. I mentioned there is a transition to, I mean, I did say that in uh, Paradise is, uh, is, is the, the world of aesthetics, where the ethical uh, ordering uh, is liquidated in a, cer in a certain sense. So the question is, how does this respond to the whole arc of the poem? What kind of, uh, how, what, am I, what am I really saying about the whole experience of the poem to make, make the aesthetic uh, essential for knowledge? That's, that's the argument. And that is true. I, I, I really welcome this question because that's the way I'm reading poetry, as if poetry were a way of knowing. I, have, I keep saying this, uh, that it's really a way of knowing uh, um, uh, or from that point of view, a philosophical kind of uh, poetry, realizing and keeping in mind that there are always distinctions and, and ongoing uh, quarrels between poetry uh, and, uh, and philosophy. Uh, Paradiso is, see, uh, like any true ethics, this is a, a, a general pronouncement, that's, that doesn't make it, but it's a, a kind of premise to what I'm, I'll be saying later. Any true ethics can only be successful in the measure in which it stops operating. That's when the ethics is really, uh, uh, you can say that it has done its job, as it were. So we enter a world where now is the world of paradise, and, uh, and Dante goes on uh, representing this, this world. He'll never forget the earth. It's, I have to qualify that, even in paradise, he's going to look at the earth. He celebrates the greatest as aspect of human life, uh, work, love, things that join, join the, the community together. He will see also the distortions that are going on, whether they are in the, in the empire, in the, in the political life, 
or in the life of the church. So, so, so this, every time that there is a retrospective look, there is a kind of dismay that he will feel. So there is, there is the, all of that. But the emphasis is on the, on the world of paradise is about dance, is about songs, is about, uh, it's about uh, love, it's about stars wooing each other, it's about spectacular uh, mise-en-scene, the pyrotechnics, of uh, that it's about l different forms of light. What is this about? Exactly what I call the aesthetic experience. These are all uh, poetic, uh, uh, artistic experiences. Well, the first thing we have to keep in mind is Dante really thinks of a theology that is really like poetry. A, a theology that is, poet that is like poetry in the sense that both are part of, or if you wish, I can even we won't even call it theology. Uh, well, let me call it, finish that sentence, yes. A uh, uh, theology is like put in the sense that it's, it's a playful theology, a way of understanding that the essence of God now can be seen in his comical uh, figuration. A God who is the artist, a God who, is, who, ca who, who thinks that this is the way in which human beings were supposed, were first created in the Garden of Eden, where we're really in a garden, uh, meant to play, and that's where we are going back to. It's a way of casting the divinity in the most, it's beauty, uh, a beauty that, 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 that also encompasses uh, uh, the good. But beyond that, beyond this a, a playful or, or ludic theology, this idea of an aesthetic theology, there's something else that Dante is saying about the proximity between the poetic and the religious. It's not a connection that is usually made because we tend to believe that the poetic is just the world of deceptions, make believe. The fact is that both the poetic and the religious, and we can say that even about the philosophical, if you wish, they respond to profound impulses within us. They're emotions that we have. The, you know, you see beauty and you tremble in the presence of beauty, whether it's a human beauty, it's natural beauty, or artistic beauty, whatever, whatever it is that we're encountering, there is something that responds in us. And the same thing about the idea of awe and the idea of uh, discovery or sense of the sublime whenever you have what we call a religious experience. The two are not neatly separated. This is what drives the poet in the journey of paradise. This is where the, the, the actual source of, uh, of his inspiration, that's the novelty that Dante represents and which probably some romantic poets much later, I'm talking about the 19th century, uh, have been trying to, to uh, restore or grasp or understand. You do have that in, uh, in, in Dante. Do you have it, for instance, in the Bible I dare say you do, because whenever we think about, you know, it's so, oh, it's so many courses at Yale I used to be taught. I don't look at the, uh, at, at, at the offerings anymore, because I think I know them by heart, not for any other reason. But the Bible is literature, which is great. But, you know, the, the idea, the underlying idea is always that the Bible can only has to be read, like, you know, novels. Uh, uh, and that's, that's all right. That's very good. But that's not all. To say that, as I did, that the Song of Songs is a fantastic, I said it 10 minutes ago, that the Song of Songs is a fantastic love poem, what I'm really saying is that the poetic is already in itself proximate to the religious. So that we th when we think about the Bible and literature, we are already rephrasing another version of this problem, which is that of that Dante presents as the religious and the, and the poetic in paradise. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you. First decision, is he going to think that the journey is the journey to the complacencies of the garden, to the beauty and the attraction of the garden, or is he going to turn, as he actually will, we, have a, we can say that because we have paradise that he writes, into an anti-pastoral poet. That is to say, one, a poet who is always questioning the sense of arrival and is always going on to new departures. That's really what the, the Virgil is telling him. Now, this is up to you. You have arrived here. You have arrived there where I am, where Virgil is, or you can even go further. This has a, a, there is a peculiar language that resonates behind this kind of moral dilemma which is placed in front of uh, the pilgrim's mind. It's called Felix Culpa. I don't know if you have, have you know, those of you who are readers of Milton, 
may know what I'm talking about. Felix culpa. The idea that the fall of man was actually a happy fall because it allows human beings to even want to go beyond it. So that's, that's exactly what is resonating behind this. You may sit and therefore be, uh, turn into an Adam figure who is going back to the, the beauty and innocence, which the pilgrim doesn't have really. He has a wisdom now uh, of the garden, or you can go on even uh, further than that. And then uh, here is the final uh, moment of, of, of uh, the a circle which is uh, now takes over for the, the, the words uh, that he speaks uh, from lines uh, 130 uh, on. Uh, 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 the temporal fire and eternal thou hast seen, meaning purgatory and, 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 and hell, which lasts forever. My son, and I come to a part where of, my, of myself, I discern no further. This is the limitation of Virgil's vision. This is from now on. He will be following even the, the geometry, the arrangement of uh, their journey will be completely reversed. Up to now, the pilgrim has been a disciple, therefore one who follows the vestiges of the teacher. Now. Uh, the teacher with uh, uh, Statius will be following uh, Virgil. He sees no further. And actually, I can anticipate for you the pathos of uh, Virgil's uh, uh, departure, suddenly departure, when he, the pilgrim, most wants him and needs him because Beatrice is approaching and the terror that, uh, with the terror that Beatrice represents for the pilgrim, the pilgrim will turn back and his eyes will never see uh, Virgil again. Virgil has disappeared an instant before he vanishes, an instant before Beatrice arrives, as if there's a hiatus. Uh, Dante is dramatizing the hiatus which thrives uh, until the ground, the land, produces spontaneously. Now he's capable of that spontaneous action and spontaneous uh, decisions. To the fair eyes come, rejoicing, which weeping made come to made me come to thee. Uh, thou may sit or go among them. Uh, two details are expressed by these lines. One is uh, Virgil is recapitulating in many ways uh, this first part of the journey. The journey that began in Inferno 1 and then here in Purgatory in the Garden of Eden. It began in the wilderness and then in the garden. This is, this is the first step of uh, uh, the first part, stage of the journey. Uh, you can now, uh, he remembers, that's how he recapitulates, the fair eyes that made me, that begged me to come to your help when you were uh, lost in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in shipwrecked on the wilderness of Inferno 1. So now uh, Virgil is going back to that. The second element is that this is the exercise now. Thou mayst sit or go among them. Now, this is exactly the major temptation for the pilgrim. Is he going to think that the journey to the Garden of Eden, which is a journey ahead, forward, but a journey back in time, the Garden of Eden is behind all of us, and yet it lies ahead of us. The past is really the future. He must decide whether he can go on or or, or, or sit here. It's a, between the two guides and the two uh, particular stages of his own self-knowledge and, and, and life. So let me continue with this. Thou that take henceforth thy pleasure for guide. What an extraordinary line. Take henceforth thy pleasure for guide. Uh, this is the poem of desire in the sense that what pushes the pilgrim to go on and uh, impels him to this journey of discovery and self-discovery is really desire. Desire is uh, the, 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 the moving force in him. Uh, but now the language changes. Now, in a sense, a certain, uh, the first part of the journey is over and pleasure can become uh, the guide, uh, the guidance of his own pleasure what he likes is to say, in a sense, it's an adumbration of free will. Uh, we'll talk more about 
uh, the relation between actually pleasure and happiness, the way Dante will go on dramatizing it and, and thinking about it in, uh, in, in paradise. Thou hast come forth from the steep and narrow ways. See the sun that shines on thy brow. See the grass They're near the earthly paradise. See the grass, the flowers, and trees which the ground here brings forth of itself alone. It is as if by Dante, by taking his own pleasure uh, as his guidance, he now has reached an Edenic place. He's, he done that Virgil is speaking of, of, of the pilgrim as if he was speaking of the ground that... With uh, Canto 26, the purgation of uh, the pilgrim is completed. He has been going through the various stages of... Uh, uh, purgatory from pride, as you remember, to the sin of lust. And uh, in 27, he crosses uh, a wall of fire um, so that he can be cleansed completely of all the stains that may be residual on his soul and approach and enter the, the, the Garden of Eden. This is the uh, the action uh, uh, that takes place in 27 and Canto 27 comes to a close with uh, uh, a passage that I would like to read to you and comment on. It's at the end of Canto 27 and these are really the last words that Virgil will, will speak. We will not hear from him again. Um, in fact, from now on, the pilgrim will be entirely on his own. There's no dependency on him. There is a sort of uh, actually very personal moment now that it st starts. Uh, and, and, and we'll see the drama uh, that goes with this time of uh, this, this attainment of self-mastery that uh, Dante goes on dramatizing. These are the last 